Hey, welcome to uh, the committee, Northampton City Council Committee on Legislative Matters. Um, it is November 13th, 2023, and I am the chair, Alex Jarrett. <clears throat> um, Laura, would you call the roll, please? Sure. Councillor Jarrett. Here. Councillor Elkins. Here. Councillor Moulton. Here. Councillor Nash. Here. Here. We have an echo. I think you have your own deal. You should leave it to that. To that, to that, to that. I muted you, Jim, so that that should handle it. Okay, great. And I know your microphone is not working. Okay. <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay. Are you saying that uh, it on? Yeah, in case oh, okay. uh, we want to, yeah, so, so we can hear the roll it's call. Not on? Is that what... I'm not sure. It's, oh, it's okay. not on. Uh, I'm pressing the button on the bottom and that's not doing anything. So here, I'll, we'll just get you another one for now. Thank you. Okay. Um, <clears throat> the next, uh, this meeting is being audio and video recorded, and we'll next take public comment for items not on the agenda, but not seeing anyone else in the meeting. Uh, we'll move on to approval of the minutes of the previous meeting. We have the August 14th and October 3rd minutes. Anyone like to make a motion. Uh, I move for approval. Second. Motion made by Stan Moulton, seconded by Maris Elkins. Any discussion? Roll call, please. Should I, or should we all just all in favor? Oh, roll, right. roll sure. <laughs> all in favor, say aye. 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 Any uh, nays, any abstentions? If that passes unanimously. Next, we move to 23.382, an ordinance relative to stop signs on Olander Drive and Ford Crossing. This was referred to legislative matters on uh, by the City Council on October 5th. Is anyone familiar with these? Perhaps uh, we should just uh, break well. up. The, uh, Karen spoke to it at council. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I recall it being pretty much just a cleanup of. I can speak from her remembering what she said, and also I I viewed it today, Alex. Yeah, it I'd is love, that would be great. <laughs> it is uh, the end, <laughs> the last cross street on Olander, uh, that is Ford Crossing, and it is. The placement of the two stop signs are consistent with the prior intersection, which is uh, Olander at Mosier Drive. So it is, you know, a pattern that I would expect as a motorist. Great. Yeah, yeah and I, I want to add it, this, this intersection here that um, when I viewed it a few weeks ago, the, the roadway's actually been extended up into a development so that the way it's appearing right here is just a, a right angle is no longer the case, that it's actually, um, there's a, the roadway goes straight through. And then, and I think Stan could confirm this, there's also a road, like a drive that as, as you're heading northward here off to the right as well. Isn't that right, Stan? Um, it's kind of like a four-way intersection. Uh, well, sure. No, there is a driveway to the right. There is a cross street forward to the left. And you're correct that the Olander does continue on beyond that stop, what would be the stop sign, into the last of these, uh, the housing. Thank you. 
And in that development, there is a stop sign. So the people exiting, but that, but that is not something we regulate, mm. right? Is that? I remember saying it was on private property. Right. Okay, well, that makes sense to me. Any other comments on this? Someone like to make a recommendation? I, I move a, a positive recommendation. Second. Motion made by Stan Moulton, seconded by Marissa Elkins. Any discussion? Roll call, please. Or, all in favor say aye. 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 Any uh, abstentions, any nays? So that passes unanimously. <clears throat> And we're next, we're to 23.391, uh, an ordinance relative to parking on Ward Avenue. This was referred to us uh, on November 2nd. And as I recall, this is about the <clears throat> way down to the path that runs along oh. the Mill River mm -hmm. and making sure that there wasn't um, any that no one parked within a certain distance would you be able is there a diagram for this one let's see i didn't put it on the agenda i don't believe there was she said it was also access to utilities that the dpw has there was a water main down there and they wanted to be able to back up a trailer to it if need be i think the water main actually goes down under the the path itself down there that so this is the end of my street so i know it very well <laughs> uh it is it is it is where we go to walk the dogs um so it's it's very straightforward as i recall that it's um i um i think they they had temporary no parking signs for a period of time and and folks in general there's a gate across the way and so it, kind of already had the effect of <laughs> feeling like that's not a place they should park or it'd be a um, but just in case if something comes up, they're doing this. So um, I'm I'm very familiar with it. It seems very unconcerning. Uh, it does not seem to have caused any like issues in the neighborhood in terms of people feeling like they didn't have a place to park or you know trouble accessing um, the you know sort of access to those trails and down by the river that are so generously. Um, you know, continues to be available to us, even though it's private property, mm -hmm. essentially. So um, I think it makes a lot of sense. Great. Anyone like to make a recommendation? I would move a positive recommendation. Second. Ooh, that was <laughs> yes. <laughs> a motion made by Marissa Elkin, seconded by Jim Nash. Um, any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Any abstentions? Names? No. So that passes unanimously in both 23.382 and 23.391 will be on the agenda for our next council meeting. And now we unfortunately or fortunately have a 20 minute recess <laughs> uh, because we uh, our public hearing starts at 5.30 p.m. I have a under new business. Uh -huh. Would it be possible for us to there's like a suggested date for a, a meeting for a, a special meeting could we discuss that and maybe land on that and we can get it in our planners yeah we can oh, yeah, do great. scheduling that doesn't uh uh so laura sent out an email today um proposing monday the 27th at 5 p.m just two weeks from today i heard back from stan already that you can make it. That works for me. Yep, that works for me as well. Okay, yeah. great. Is there? Uh, I was thinking that would be an in-person meeting. That'd be, be good to discuss this this issue with us here. Mm -hmm. But then it would be a hybrid meeting. Okay, that we would allow public comment. And I'll be joining you remotely from Florida. So. Oh, so it's kind of <laughs> necessary that it be uh, somewhat hybrid. <clears throat> Great. So that we think five o'clock. Yes. Okay. Cool. Any other new business? 
But now we still have a 20 minute recess. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Let's see, what else? Well, we have two items to discuss at our next, there's, there's the item put forward at our last meeting that has two uh, components to it. Uh, but I'm also wondering if the next meeting, we could just kind of also like open it up to Scrivener's errors and things that, you know, that mechanically could be changed within the rules as well. That Sorry, what are you referring to? Uh, so we're looking at rule changes at, at that special meeting, right. in particular around public comment, but also over the, the the last two years while we've been using those rules, there's been there's like little tweaks in it to that we could also consider, and um, there's one relative to uh, uh, the finance meeting and. Uh, having to do where it states that it finance needs to occur outside of a council meeting. Mm -hmm. And I'd, I'd like to look at that okay. because it results in this strange kind of like finance can't be in, we can hold all of our other committees within council if we want, but not finance per the rules. So anyway. So I think that that would need to be referred because Legislative matters can't self-generate what it talks mm -hmm. about. It, it Things have to be referred to it. Um, and since only rule 4.8 was referred, mm -hmm. that we would maybe at our next council meeting need to refer the additional. So I got to show up with those. Okay, I'll tell. The, I'll talk to the council president about <laughs> that. Yeah, <so laughs> that's good. Um, or at least, you know, the the top, the numbers you're looking at. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Something. Uh, Oh yeah, I could do that on Thursday, and then it we could bring it up at the next meeting. It could still go on. Yeah. Right. Okay. Good. Yeah. All right. I like that. All right. I mean, it's going to be December and meetings when we don't want to have the things on. It. I'm just <laughs> just I say it. Publicly state that. So, <laughs> uh, but yeah. I I have an interest in uh, us renumbering uh, the the council rules to something that doesn't involve so many little eyes because mm. it's strange okay. <laughs> uh, but that's that's a that's not substantive but mm. well do let the council president know you're interested yeah you could submit some to this we could submit something together <laughs> yeah we'll discuss that <laughs> you know we have 18 minutes <laughs> uh, 16, 16 by my count so uh, unless there's any other new business i would uh propose we i would say let's go into recess let's do it okay, okay.
<laughs> All right, I believe with David Whitehill, Whitehill here, we have a quorum for the planning board. Hi, sorry I'm late, everyone. Welcome, David. So, hey. and we are recording again? We are. Okay. So welcome to the joint meeting of the planning board and the committee, city council committee on legislative matters, um, <clears throat> the city of Northampton. And uh, we will need to call the roll for the planning board. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is George Cote. I'm the chair of the planning board. Um, I'm here. We don't often call roll at planning board meetings, but that's a procedure of the, the council. So we're glad to do that. Um, do you want me to do that? Or I all if right. you don't do it normally, it's fine. We can just note no, we here. Will. We we're good practice for us. Okay. Um, David. Yes. Hello. I'm here. Hello, you're here. That's great. Chris Tate. Yes. Uh Jenna White. Hi there. <laughs> My cat's here too. <laughs> Stacy. Not yet. Okay. There are four okay. members uh, present, which is a quorum for the planning board. Stacy is here, just needs to be made a co-host so she can unmute. So referred to us from the city council um, was 23.349, an ordinance to amend chapter 350-12.2, outdoor lighting, uh, public hearing on this, I mean, a notice of public hearing was published October 30th and November 6th. Um, and uh, so that is now uh, before us. And um, we will need a motion to open the public hearing for both bodies. So moved. Second. Motion made by Stan Moulton, seconded by Marissa Elkins mm -hmm. to open the public hearing. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Is that permitted when another body is remote? <laughs> I guess let's do a roll call just in case. Uh, oh, that's a good question. Because we are. Okay. I, of both boards then? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Although okay. Uh, we haven't done a motion for the planning board yet. If, oh. if that's required for you all, but we're just doing, no. we're voting on the motion for, to open the public hearing for legislative matters. Okay. Councillor Jarrett. Yes. Councillor Elkins. Yes. Councillor Moulton. Yes. And Councillor Nash. Yes. Motion to open the public hearing passed unanimously. Great. Just to clarify, the planning board doesn't have a motion. We don't vote to open a public hearing. We just make a motion to close public comment or public hearings. Okay, great. So the public hearing is now open for both bodies. And um, Carolyn Mish, as a proponent, would you like to speak? Um, thank you. Yes. Um, good evening, everybody. Um, so the lighting ordinance in... Um, that's on the agenda today uh, represents um, a pretty substantial overhaul from of the lighting ordinance that was last updated in 2007. And um, we're woefully behind in updating the technology um, to accommodate all the changes that have happened um, in the lighting industry since 2007. Um, we started working on this several years ago and just kind of stopped and started and stopped and started. So um, what you have in front of you is sort of a re-evaluation um, of the standards, um, 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 the control, um, regulatory control um, standards for um, lighting levels, um, it, it would control um, what we refer to as color temperature of lighting, and this addresses the new LED technology um, that most, um, both commercial and residential applications uh, we're seeing now. And then um, also sort of address issues relating to um, more effectively addressing glare and um, backlight and other sources of um light that have that are problematic for um 
the uh, residents and um, on business sites. And so um, the ordinance, I'm not going to, I don't think we necessarily need to read through the entire ordinance. Some of the elements are consistent for what we have now. So there's a discussion about the goals of the lighting, which are to control offsite impacts, glare, um, make sure that there's um, enough lighting to create safe passage from um, places, particularly in pedestrian ways, direct lighting where it's most appropriate. And, and that, of course, leads to energy efficiency because we want to make sure that there's only lighting that's necessary to achieve those um, um, objectives. And also um, wanting to continue to address the um, in, any environmental impacts of excess lighting or um, night sky glow, which has been in the ordinance for um, years already, but it's just sort of reinforced in this um, in this um, um, new change. Um, sorry, I just saw an issue here. Um, so we've also added definitions um, to uh, um, speak to the change in technology. So we've added a definition of correlated color temperature, uh, which is um, sort of a, the easiest way to think about that is, is it's actually a measurement of the uh, appearance of light, but um, mostly um, it's... Um, sort of expressed in cooler or warmer lighting, and there's a value um, rating attached to that. And there are different impacts um, and effects of those different color temperatures. So we want to um, control that. Um, we've added a definition of um, um, up lighting and ratings for lighting that relate to how much light is projected forward and back behind a light source, as well as up lighting. We've always had a restriction against up lighting, or at least for the last 20 plus years. So that's not new in itself, but there's a new rating system. Um, so then um, the ordinance goes into um, standards about um, what um, light fixtures should be, um, how they should be controlled in terms of their physical constraint to ensure we don't have up lighting. So it's referred to as cut off, light cut off so that we don't have light above um, a 90 degree um, angle um, from the vertical. Um, and then um, there we had ray, um, um, illumination levels and maximum levels identified by districts, but we've changed some of the districts and we are also changing the way that we're measuring those and looking at those. So that's included in this. Um, so by zoning di um, district, there's a proposal for maximum lumens over doorways specifically or at doorways um, in residential and commercial districts. And those are all delineated differently depending on the zoning district. And then the maximum foot candles um, sort of across the site, also looking at um, a per square foot measurement of lighting standards. Um, and then calling out specific situations that generally um, we don't have currently now in the books. We sort of treat all the uses the same, but there are some uses that over the years, the planning board has had to um, evaluate waivers, requested waivers from those standards because they typically, um, uh, the applicants for these uses typically want brighter light. So for gas station canopies, sometimes for car sale, auto sale lots, as well as um, banking or ATM facilities. So there are those three categories are added as sort of special classes, even within districts where lighting levels can go a little bit higher than um, what a typical commercial site would have, like the grocery store um, um, scenario. So those that's what's changed in this ordinance. Um, the um, just going through the um, there's also an addition about controlling light in terms of the time that lights uh, site lights um, are allowed. And again, many of these 
um, code changes relate to situations that the planning board has had to deal with over the years and also conditions that the board planning board and zoning board i should say have applied to applications um, for projects so um, many times there are conditions requiring that at the close of business all the site lights or sign lights um, need to be turned off so that's sort of incorporated into language into this proposed um, new code. Um, the other area that um, has um, evolved a little bit is related to the sign light. So internal illumination of signs as well as external um, sign lighting and differentiating a little bit more distinctly about the surface colors and what, what effect those um, different light levels have. Um, and then specifying um exemptions um and so street lights and street light standards and then exemptions and um i want to acknowledge that you know this code went for came to city council as sort of a, a real draft and sort of partially baked as opposed to typically we present zoning ordinance amendments that um, are pretty close to being ready for prime time, um, but wanting to obviously hear public comment. Um, there's been so much discussion in the community about lighting standards and um, different um, evaluation of what should be, you know, how far should we go? What should we include? That um, this was really presented knowing that there was going to be a lot more hands-on work by the counselors and by planning board through the public hearing process um, to make sure that we sort of, we get that right. And I also want to um, express that we've been working, I've been working with the former building commissioner, Louis Hasbrook, who has a lot of experience and technical expertise on lighting and enforcement and how it works in Northampton, as well as um, we've um, been collaborating with John Fry, who's currently the person in the building department who's doing a lot of enforcement and um, um, uses the light meter and goes out and evaluates um, um, con, um, issues that are raised by um, people in the community about whether or not, you know, asking about whether um, light levels are in excess of what the standards are. So um, we've been trying to incorporate um, both changing technology as well as what makes sense for enforcement in Northampton um, and what kinds of issues we're seeing at the um, planning board and zoning board level, but also at the complaint level that come, you know, that comes into the building department. Um, to that end, we've also received, since this was introduced, some comments um, um, suggesting modifications to or adding questions to this text. And um, just so everyone knows, Councilor Jared and I met this afternoon and sort of went through some of those comments that were um, submitted. And um, I have, um, we've talked about some um, clarification and modifications that might make sense. But in particular, I'll highlight one of those is related to um, sort of generally a question about whether all site lights for commercial applications should be um, just categorically controlled to be turned off at the close of business. There aren't a lot of businesses that are open 24 hours. So um, does it make sense to both have a restriction on sign lighting when businesses are closed as well as parking lot lighting? Um, so that is discussed in the draft that you all have. Um, discussed, meaning it's proposed as um, um, an option to have lights dim and then be turned off after midnight or put on motion control. But I think the sort of taking a step back, the bigger question is, should, do we as a community want to just say, 
you know, sign lighting and, and site lighting is not necessary to be on all night long if the business isn't open. So I think that's probably one of the bigger questions to sort of tackle and, and discuss because that, um, it, you know, I think that will, can address a lot of, um, you know, the concern around the community about the impacts of excess lighting. The other piece is, um, also about street lighting and how much we allow um, and use this um, rating referred to as a bug rating, which is um, you can get for it, it, it refers to the backlight, the uplight and the glare sort of light levels. Um, and it's pretty easy to um, evaluate those for bigger projects because the lighting engineers submit you know, their package of photometric plans to the planning board, we can review them on bigger projects. So this wouldn't really be applicable to residential scale or single to multifamily kind of housing, but more bigger scale and street lights. And this, of course, um, relates to when and if we ever change street lights in the city, sort of what those levels makes, um, what those ratings and application of those ratings should be on the street. So, um, I have some proposed modifications or additions to the draft that was originally sent to you all, but I'll leave it at that and take it from there. Questions from you guys. Okay, thanks, thanks, Karen. Um, yeah, should we take questions from the uh, committee and board and then open it up to the wider public? Okay. <clears throat> That to see here. Questions. So, Carolyn, I, I uh, want to turn on your mic. Thank you, Carolyn. Thanks for the the background, the description, um, and and some of the conversations you've had since the draft went to legislative matters. And I appreciate that it's kind of a rough, rough draft at this point. Um, and so we have a very proactive group in the city, the Dark Skies, Northampton Dark Skies. And um, have they been in touch with you with some of their recommendations? Because, um, uh, and I, I think, you know, we may hear later from their representative here who's in uh, council chambers, but I just want to see how much, if any, they, they've had a chance to weigh in on this rough draft. Um, I received the the information that I received was from James Lowenthal, so I don't know what, you know, beyond that, I can't tell you. Um, that's the only comment I've received. Okay. okay. Yep. Yeah, it's Northampton City Lights. Oh, that's what it is. Not Northampton Dark Skies. Thank you. Because um, I bring that up because I had a conversation with them six or eight months ago. Um, some of it related to our lighting ordinance, some of it related to lighting on the rail trail, um, <clears throat> just because there was a fear that part of this was going to extend to the rail trail. Um, but they had some very valid points, and uh, there's more than um, it, it was a group of people. So um, and I and I don't know how much they've had an opportunity to to, to provide input to this, but I thought that there'd be more of a crowd today. So I just wanted to see if something had come across what were the rail trail comments i think it was really more of a rumor there was talk about it over in east hampton so then folks were very worried that perhaps it would happen in the manhand trail it would happen here okay. i certainly Just, said no as a planning board member and Spencer, there was no plans at all to illuminate the rail trail yeah i mean so just to answer so this is about the lighting or uh an ordinance that would address um, private property lighting and street lighting, but not necessarily speak to anything that might be proposed for other infrastructure. Um, so I don't think it's relevant to the rail trail conversation because that, but I will say though, you know, um, we haven't, I mean, I think that would be a community discussion, right? Yeah. If if it made sense to, I will say that um, MassDOT has um, asked about uh, in their new shared use paths, have they, they've asked about um, 
whether or not lighting is proposed in certain paths. I've heard individuals ask, oh, is this path going to be lit? And so I think it's really community by community that makes that decision. No, and I don't mean to go down that road about the rail trails. It was just, that's what initiated my conversation. Okay. I see. Sorry. Group, and then yeah. we had a discussion about many other things having mm -hmm. to do with lighting ordinances. Okay. So I just wanted to make sure that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. Thank you, Carolyn, for being here. Um, so this this does regulate street lights. Um, so the current lights we have over the roadways and that um, and I know there was a lot of concern about the recent replacements that went out. Oh, you know, like, I guess, about eight, nine years ago. That's right. And with these. So. Would those be allowed, those lights, the ones we have now, be allowed to be replaced with the same lights or or is there changes in the regulation? So um, illuminate me. <laughs> I will try <laughs> I to bring some light to that a conversation. <laughs> oh. um, so the, um, I don't know, um, the street lights that were um, replaced however many years ago, I don't know what specifications those um, were or are. This ordinance addresses street lights and creates um, a new standard for street lights, but only for new street lights. So this would not be retroactive for any property, for any street light, um, commercial residential, what have you, but it would affect new lighting. So for example, um, the new lights that we're going to have as part of Picture Main Street would have to meet these standards. Um, um, and if we were to replace any of the lighting um, anywhere else in the city that was city-owned lighting, then those these would be applicable. These are standards we did not have previously when the street lights were modified. So I believe, um, so these would be different and they would have, um, there would be different criteria. So one of the things that's um, identified in this draft ordinance is about um, the bug ratings for street lights um, based on comments that came in from James Lowenthal. Um, I worked on um, sort of tweaking that to make it more explicit about the standards for bug ratings um, based on the street or street type. So the core central business district would have a slightly, my recommendation is a slightly different bug rating than maybe some of the side streets. And that's because the, one of the issues that's been raised is this the backlight standard that is the light cast behind a street light that is typically at the edge of the right of way, which means it's also going to be casting onto private property. And so that's the concern there. You can't have a zero foot candle or zero light spillover for a street light because it really, by its nature, it's near the edge or at the edge of the private property and the street line. Um, so there's been a conversation about how much um, backlight is should be allowed on street lights and um, why you would want more sort of G value or or a glare and backlight for a street light is that you want to make sure you're covering as much of the sidewalk and the pedestrian area as possible. And so sidewalks on Main Street are wider and they will be even more wide <laughs> when we get done with this great project. Um, and whereas in the residential districts, they're narrower. So maybe you don't need that casting back to such a great extent on those residential districts. So that's why there it probably makes sense to have different values in the residential versus um, the core commercial districts. Um, and that is something we don't have currently in our, in our, or we didn't have previously when those new street lights were um, um, installed across the city. 
Okay. So you feel that this the new regs will address a, many of the concerns that were raised back at that time. That there was a, there was just there was a lot of vibrant discussion going on, and that this is our opportunity to correct and address most of that. It is, but I will, you know, from my understanding of those conversations that, you know, there was a lot of discussion about putting shields on some lights because they were shining into people's bedrooms or even other rooms in people's homes. Um, and that there was um, effectively greater glare at that level. So I think streetlights are going to be problematic almost no matter what, if, you know, because they're tall, they're high up, you're, there's going to be some, but I think if you're controlling the maximum output, the illuminate the levels, and then if you have this additional standard for, or rating that you are com in compliance with this rating, it will address some of that. I couldn't guarantee, I'm not an engineer, um, I couldn't guarantee that there still wouldn't be complaints because I think the nature of streetlights are that you can't address everybody's concern, every window, every, you know, angle. Um, but you can certainly greatly reduce that impact. And, and, and also, so are we addressing the temperature or color of the light as well? Yes. Because that I recalled that was a big concern. Yes, true. I blueness the right. So this propose this ordinance proposes um, a maximum of um, twenty seven hundred Kelvin, which is the temperature that is more warm. And I think, if I recall, although I think, and James might know this, but I feel like the street lights maybe were. 35 to 4,000, um, but they may have been knocked down. Some of them may have been adjusted and I, I, I just don't have the data on the existing street lights. So I don't, don't quote me on that. Thank you. So just a real quick follow-up on street lights. And many Your mic. A, a real quick follow-up on street lights. And many of you may already know this, but street lights are installed on telephone poles owned by the telephone company, but the power company installs them. And the power company in this situation is just like a vendor, like an electrician who goes and works at Starbucks and puts a light up there. They have to abide by our codes, right? And they don't, their needs don't trump our codes, um, our ordinances which is probably different than signal lights that DOT installs. They have their own set of standards and their standards trump ours. I'm just trying to figure out these different um, utilities, so to speak, yeah. that work in our, our, our city. Um, this, it's even a little bit more complicated than that. <laughs> And maybe but we want to essentially yes. So so the signals, the traffic signals are, you know, controlled and um spec specified based on, you know, this federal highway standard. Um but the um lights now we've there's been a transition where the city does own a significant portion of the lights. And we pay the utility for the power. Um, it used to be the utility owned most of the lights. Right. So that's transitioned a little bit. Okay. And we pay them for installations or upgrades probably. Um, I don't even know that. I think we're responsible for um, contracting to get repairs or, um, yeah. Thanks. And thankfully that's not my job. To know. <laughs> <laughs> Does anyone else have questions for Carolyn? Just want to following up on what George is talking about with utility poles. I mean, that is one constraint we're limited to. If we're mounting street lights to utility poles, that's kind of our light spacing. So I don't we don't want to paint ourselves into a corner where we have uh 
glare metrics or something, and then we can't uniformly light our streets without adding additional light poles, light specific poles, as opposed to utility poles. So just something to think about. And Karen, is that a concern in, in the proposed language? Um, well, I think the language would allow sort of relief um, from the standards by going to the planning board. So the other pieces, I don't know. I mean, um, there's no plan to replace the streetlights um, anytime soon. I mean, that's a huge undertaking and not that it wouldn't happen ever again, but um, we're, these or the ordinances would not um, require the city, of course, to go and change all the streetlights now. Right. Um, and so if there were that issue, I think that's a valid concern that we're sort of stuck with the spacing to some degree. Um, and we certainly, I don't think anyone's jumping up and down asking for new poles to be planted along the streets to um, fill in any of those gaps. So it is an important conversation that we'll need to be, that we would need to have. Um, I think it would be really difficult to have an ordinance that first evaluated where all the poles are now and then figured out what this, what the standard would be. I think it's probably better to have the standard. And if some areas needed to be flexed because it didn't work, then that would be a public review process. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Yeah. Other questions before we open it up to the public? I have a question um, about some of the language in the goals section around planning board waivers. Um, it's written that such waivers may be granted if and only if these goals are being achieved and increased energy efficiency is achieved. I'm not, I find the second half of that sentence a little bit vague. Do you mean increase energy efficiency? Is that better than it was previously? Is that better than what's written into these standards? What, what would constitute increased? Because um, this doesn't feel, uh, this would be hard to implement to me. Um, good question. Um, I think that it, the intention w was um, increased energy efficiency over what's existing or what it's replacing or um, for that condition. But um, it's a good point that it should be clarified and whether or not that's the appropriate standard. I think that's a very similar language to what's in the code already. Um, not to say that, and I'm not suggesting we have to keep that at all. I think that um, it's it's a good point to sort of think about what makes sense for granting a waiver because the planning board will obviously be put in that position um, at any given time for any given application. So if we mm. stick with that, then just to make sure I'm understanding, then if this language stays as written, somebody, an applicant could come forward and say that they want to improve uh, the efficiency of what's currently there, but at a level that does not, that does not meet the standards, the new standards that we're hoping to adopt here. Um. As long as the board felt like the uh, the goals of the other goals of the ordinance are being met, that would be part of the evaluation criteria. Okay. David. Yeah, so I guess this is kind of related to that. The way I am understanding this is that this would come into play with existing buildings only when they come before the zoning board or planning board for something else like triggered by something else, then we would review this. Um, or if they're doing light replacement, not bulb replacement, but like lighting replacement. But that's by the building, like that wouldn't come before the planning board. That would just be a staff level review. Right. So if an applicant comes to the building departments and um, they want to swap out all the lighting in a parking lot, let's say there's a new user and they're doing a soup to nuts renovation, but it's the same type of use. It doesn't trigger any other board review. As long as they're meeting these standards, then they can go right to building. They can go right through permitting. 
they wouldn't have to come to the planning board. So if they wanted uh, um, a different application, different light levels, then that would automatically trigger a planning board review of what they were doing because they wouldn't be able to do it without that approval from the planning board. Um, they might have to come to the planning board anyway for other, so let's say a 5,000 square foot addition is being proposed as part of this big renovation. Then the planning board is going to look at everything, photometric plans, um, all of that gets submitted as part of the planning board review. And then it, no matter what, even if they were proposing to comply with everything, it would still be under your review as sort of a check to make sure they were meeting that. Sure. Um, and then secondarily, just this is like highly technical. This is one of the most complicated parts of um, the design process, just because it's changing technology. And has this been reviewed by a design, a lighting designer or an installer just to like, I like going back to what someone else said about painting ourselves into a corner, just, just to make sure that we're not legislating something that's almost, you know, nearly impossible to uh, comply with. Um. We had this latest iteration hasn't gone through to somebody else to review. We did have the street light standards um, reviewed by a designer, um, but that was several months ago. So, um, and then I think, um, and then we've grabbed some of these um, standards from other codes, but that's not a, you know, a lighting um, designer and engineer. I will also say that um, not the specific lumen levels, but certainly the planning board, you, the planning board has reviewed projects and pushed applicants to be, um, to comply with several of these um, criteria in, in this, even though this wasn't part of the code. Um, so we've had some feedback that way, but um, it's a slightly different way of looking at, um, you know, the lighting requirements and submittals. Yeah, I'm, I'm just thinking specifically about like the trade-off between light levels and glare and spacing and all those things. It's not immediately obvious, right? Looking at it. Yeah. Uh, from, from us lay people. So, okay, thanks. George? Um... So there's a lot in here about the sign, sign lighting. Yeah. And, and traditionally, the planning board really has nothing to do with signs other than the placement of it and make sure it doesn't obstruct traffic or it's not in a tree belt or things of that nature. Signage, <clears throat> it's, um, it's, it's lighting impact, I think, is always handled elsewhere. And it will continue to do so, probably by the building department. Right. Um, the zoning board sometimes looks at it because they approve um, uh, um, modifications to signs that aren't by right standards. So the zoning board is often um, in the position of evaluating sign lighting. But otherwise, it goes through the building department for building department review. And as you know, we had that walk last week and um, the building department has a, a meter to evaluate sign lighting. And so that they do that as well on the um, in terms of enforcement. Um, just a, a second question, a little bit off that topic, just in terms of process, usually when the planning board looks at a, a no ordinance revision, it's a one page or a page and a half. And we do go through it line by line. This is kind of, this is a much bigger piece of literature. Um, and I don't think we're going to go through it line by line. So how can we provide like, you know, wordsmithing suggestions or things like that? Um, I'll, I'll leave it up to you. I mean, I, it's fine if you want to go through section by section by section, or if you want to read out your recommended edits. I mean, I'll leave it to the chairs, you and um, Councillor Jarrett. Uh, and we can take whatever time. You, I mean, if you want to go through line by line, we can do that. Um, so I'll leave it to you. Probably not tonight. I'm not sure if the uh, legislative matters is prepared for that, to go through line by line this document. Um, 
So I will say, you know, we, we met earlier and identified a number of changes that, that you were thinking you m would suggest would mm -hmm. incorporate. Um, <clears throat> and so I'm wondering if in that revision that you might make, you could also take those specific line by line suggestions. Yeah. Um, it does mean that if, if the planning board is going to consider again, that, that they would need to review this again, either by keeping the public hearing open or um, reviewing it at a later meeting. Uh, <clears throat> so that, that, but, but it does seem, you know, based on the, the feedback we've gotten and the things that you, you, you know, you and I have already looked at that there, there are going to be some substantial um, revisions before we would at, ask, get approval at city council. Yeah. And I mean, and if you would like, I mean, I did um, make some red lines to that, um, that I'd be happy to screen share, but I don't know if you want to do that now, not do it, you know, take more public comment, um, whatever you all want to do with that. Well, I'd be interested in bringing in members of the public. And then of course we can continue to have questions. So unless there are pressing questions now, I would uh, have open it up to um, members or members of the public here and remote. And um, this, we set up this room assuming that uh, oh, yeah, every, you know every single one of the planning board members might be here. So I would suggest we move this podium a little bit closer so we're not just having a job. There we go. Make sure uh, the mic's yes. on. Turn that on. Okay. And I'll recognize James Lowenthal, if you could state your uh, name and city or town. Thanks. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, I'm James Lowenthal. I live in Northampton and I work at Smith College and I lead Northampton City Lights, which is a citizens group uh, that has a steering committee of 10 people, none of whom besides me could make it today. Uh, they send their regrets. Uh, but they are involved in this process and we represent hundreds of people in uh, Northampton who care about uh, preserving darkness, natural darkness at night and uh, minimizing light pollution. And this is a absolutely critical piece in that effort. Um, I also uh, lead the statewide chapter of Dark Sky International. It's called Dark Sky Massachusetts. Um, I'm very active at the national level. I lead the American Astronomical Society uh, Committee on Light Pollution, and I uh, co-lead the International Astronomical Union's uh, Site Protection, which is basically an anti-light pollution committee. So I'm deeply involved in this. Um, and uh, I want to thank especially Carolyn for uh, the years of uh, dedication to this issue. And I know um, uh, we've had many, many discussions over the years, uh, it's, including before the current version of the um, of city code on lighting. Um, that code, of course, predates LEDs. So much has changed in the last 15 years. The technology is just is rapidly, rapidly changing. And probably LEDs are not the final end of the line. They're here to stay for maybe our lifetime, but they'll be replaced by something else in the future. For now, it's LEDs and the, the, uh, the, the current code on the books doesn't even mention them. And the design of lights has changed as a result of LEDs. For example, the way we think about shielding of lights has changed because so many lights, including all of our street lights now, just have the LEDs stuck right on the on the bottom plate. And that means it, a lot of glare is really possible. And in fact, the, the, the companies that make these lights, and there are thousands of these companies, have put a lot of work into spreading light out sideways uh, in the um, mistaken belief that that's the best lighting. And so we automatically get glare that's very poorly controlled and is, in most cases, reducing visibility instead of increasing it. Um, so thanks for the, the hard work and the opportunity to weigh in. I think the values are fantastic that are um, articulated and embedded throughout this um, draft. And the values are that uh, darkness at night is worth preserving and that uh, that good lighting actually enhances safety and uh, bad lighting doesn't. And that... Um, public health is at risk from bad lighting and that wildlife is at risk from bad lighting and that the night sky is at risk from bad lighting. And by bad lighting, we mean bad lighting that is excessive, that's too blue, 
uh, that's left on all night long, even when it's not necessary, that is going in all directions, even up in the sky, rather than just down on the ground where it's actually useful. So that comes through really, really clearly and strongly. And so thank you for that. Um, roughly a half of light pollution is difficult to measure. It varies greatly from city to city. Roughly half comes from uh, street lights and parking lot lights. The other half, roughly, again, from residential and commercial. And uh, what, one of the things I really love about this new draft is that it applies to both. It explicitly includes uh, the city's decisions for its own municipal lighting. Uh, it's fantastic. Um, I love that the, the the main elements of how to get lighting right are included, that color would be controlled. Uh, blue light, excessive blue light is especially bad for human health, for wildlife, for uh, the night sky, for glare, uh, for safety of drivers, et cetera. Cutting back on the blue light by minimizing, by, by setting a cap of 2,700 Kelvin is a great thing to do. Currently, we have 3,000 Kelvin street lights, and that's your question before. Uh, but the lights in Pulaski Park right out here are 4,000 K. Those are bluer than the American Medical Association said back in 2016 should be used. They're bluer than Dark Sky International says should be used. They're bluer than any uh, biologist or human health experts agree is, is a good idea. Um, fortunately, the street lights are, are 3,000. But let's keep in mind the street lights that they've replaced were 2,000. High pressure sodium lights, the, the yellowy gold and pinkish lights that we all grew up with, there's still some around. Those are a color of only 2,000. So 3,000 is already much bluer than that, uh, but I really appreciate the limits uh, in the in the current draft. Uh, the limits on glare are essential. Glare is the culprit, um, and uh, I appreciate the uh, the uh, the limits on brightness. Um, these these are the three main elements of uh, of how to control light pollution: the amount of light, the brightness, the color of light, and the direction of light, uh, keeping it going down on the ground. And those are all in here. Um, with all that said, the details are super important, and it's a it's definitely a you know it's a complex technical issue, and um, it's critical that we get it right, and it's critical that it be understandable, and that uh, that any project proponent can actually enact the the values that we're we're hoping to promote here, um, and. My recommendation would be to get explicit advice, more advice as we move towards a final version uh, from a dark sky friendly lighting designer, not just um, a sort of McDonald's type lighting designer who will just take something off the shelf that's high glare and too bright uh, and will just you know barely meet the standards we're talking about, but who really understands how to do it right. Um, there are lots available. Um, I recommend Glenn Heinmiller, who provided detailed comments to our draft. Uh, he's in Cambridge. And by the way, I have no financial stake in any of these. I'm just putting out names that are in my uh, my circles. Jane Slade, also here in Massachusetts, um, an accredited member of IALD, the um, International Association of Lighting Designers. Uh, Nancy Clanton in Boulder, Colorado. Jim Benya. Um, Suzanne Tillerson in New York City, who did the library at Smith College, has been here to Northampton before, has walked around Pulaski Park and Main Street and seen our lights and she, I mean, you could probably talk to her on the phone. She'll remember it and say, okay, what's good and what's bad and how can we fix it? Um, uh, John Barentine in Tucson, Dark Sky Consulting. He helps cities and towns across the country, around the world with their lighting bylaws. He is a total expert at this. This is what he does professionally. And I can't recommend strongly enough that we would benefit from uh, from just, it's going to be good money if we spend it. And some of them, who knows, not for me to say, might do it pro bono. Um, Regarding street lights, uh, there's a growing consensus, that, uh, and this comes uh, not just from dark sky advocates, but from lighting engineers, including the Illuminating Engineering Society, uh, that from lots of scientific study, that street lights are basically not needed at, for streets with speeds below about 25 miles an hour. That the the benefit from headlights, car headlights, vastly outweighs the benefits from street lights, and they're just not needed. With that said, if we want to light the sidewalks then let's light the sidewalks. But let's not try to light the sidewalks with street lights that have high glare and they're too bright and they're shining people's windows and they're wasting energy and they're not needed on the streets. Um, there are many, many good models of street lights. With that said, if we're going to have street lights, if we're going to put in new street lights, we don't have to have street lights with glare. It's totally possible to get the light you want without the glare. And in fact, it's just um, it's an industry canard that uh, illumination is the gold standard that you want uh, even illumination everywhere on the ground. That's just not true. 
Uh, there's a claim that, oh, there's the ladder effect that if you have bright, dark, bright, dark down the street, the I won't be able to accommodate that. That's not true. Um, the eye can accommodate many tens of factors between darkness and brightness. But I'll, I'm happy to show you examples where here in town, the eye can accommodate. It's 100 times brighter than here. You can see fine as long as the, the light's not poking you in the eye with direct glare. That's the culprit. That's what ruins your visibility. If you can see the light source directly, that's bad. The light should be in a can facing down. And then your eye can accommodate easily tens to hundreds in factor from bright to dark. Um, and there's, there's lots of evidence for that. Um, so um, there's lots more to say about how to do street lighting um, better than we do it now. I, I, I'm, I'm sorry that the street lights we have now, we're not done with a lot of thought for uh, many of these issues. You're right, it, it's too late. What's not too late is to add controls to the street lights. And our street lights were chosen uh, with seven pin um, connectors at the top, which basically means they're ready to take a gizmo that can talk smartly to other street lights, to a controller. So, you know, one of you or this, uh, the DPW or central services could, somebody could pull up on their, their phone, a map of all the lights and have direct information for how bright the lights are, how much is on right now, what's broken or what's not. Our lights are ready to do that but we decided not to get the controls. Uh, and we could go into the long, uh, a longer discussion if you want to about why we didn't do that and what would benefit if we could do that. But the main benefits are uh, that we could then uh, immediately start saving energy and eventually start saving money. Uh, right now, because of the pricing structure, we won't see the direct results of that. But we'll also get a result from uh, controlling glare better just by cutting the light levels down. And, um, you know, we, right now we have all our street lights on all night long, whether we need them or not. And so I appreciate very much the, uh, the new inclusion of, um, of, of controls through all of uh, the text here and that the city would be, um, would be required to adhere to those as well. I know that the new lights at, um, at the roundhouse parking lot right here actually do have controls and they, they uh, dim late at night. And uh, I know that the that central services is talking about possibly implementing implementing the same thing on uh, some of the, the downtown street lights. That's a fantastic move forward. Finally, I just want to say there is no replacement for uh, actually going around and looking at lights together. And I invite you to have a uh, either joint or separate legislative matters and planning board <clears throat> walk with me and, and other interested folks at night, just walking around downtown for half an hour to an hour and just talk about the lights and look at them together. And there's not, there's nothing like that for really understanding what the issues are. And then we can, we can tell, well, would that apply to this or would it not apply? And, and how would, you know, there's a problem light, would it be fixed or not? Uh, would it be prevented or not? So I, I want to put that out to you. I hope you'll say yes. If you don't say yes, if you can't do it, you can't fit in your busy schedule or you don't want to or open meeting law or whatever doesn't let that happen, then please go to Smith College, look at the new lights outside the Nielsen Library. Uh, please go to Historic Northampton, see the new lights they put in there. And those are two examples of, of great lights that uh, would be um, that would, would reflect all of the excellent values that I see in this draft ordinance. So thank you for the opportunity to weigh in. And I, and I hope that we will have a chance to to continue and to to iterate on future drafts. Thank you. Great, thank you, James. Thanks, James. Are there any other members of the public um, remotely who would like to speak? You can um, raise your virtual hand, or you could turn on your video and wave your hand. Okay, not seeing any. Um, turn it back to questions and uh, <clears throat> further comment from members. George. Well, I'll, I'll just highlight a couple of things that I hope that the code, the, the new ordinance addresses. And uh, as I drive around town, not only our town, but other towns, um, and one of them is the uh, <clears throat> the parking lots of businesses that are closed and the lights are on 100 percent for 24 hours. Well, from dusk until dawn when the store is not open. So I, 
I, I would really appreciate wrestling with that idea of the citywide question that you talked about. How do we uh, come upon a consensus about having lights turn off with uh, photovoltaic or motion sensors? Um, <clears throat> I know that can get expensive too when you're talking about a multi-array of lights, but I think it's really something we need to look at. And the planning board has done it on a smaller residential scale. scale. Um, the other thing that's a real bug, bugaboo for me is uh, sports complexes. Uh, this is why I I'm going to beat up on Amherst a little bit and UMass. The lights are on all night long out there by the uh, Stonehenge um, area, and it's never being used. We see that at Smith College. We see that sometimes at Smith Folk in Northampton High School. Um, so, and I know we note in here that sports complexes, which I, I imagine implies our uh, high school um, areas too will not be um, legislated by this code. So I would want to look at that again too, because I think there's a lot of savings there. Well, I think it says the the code related to that is uh, that the lights have to be turned off 30 minutes after the last sponsored event. Does it? Okay. Yeah. And, and um, so I think that... Um, so exempt, but still needing to meet that standard. So exempt from the B, the bug ratings um, and the light levels, because uh, but otherwise they'd have to turn off thirty minutes after. Um, that's um, but it sounds horrendous about UMass. I didn't realize that. I mean, the, I know the high school turns off its lights pretty quickly after the end of a, a function. So. There, well, there are certain parts of UMass where they have intramural sports at night, field sports, yeah. and those lights are on. But there's other areas of the campus, their sports stadium, yeah. other large parking lots, and they're on all night long when there's no sports activity going on. Um, So thanks. Yeah, just those two areas. I want to make sure that we look at a little closer as we move down this road. I think one of the issues that we, uh, that Councilor Jared and I talked about this afternoon is sort of raising that issue about debating whether for new lights that those site lights just need to be turned off at, at the close of business. And so I think that's something that, um, that, um, you know, can be decided from as basically a policy and then regulatory function. Um, you know, if yeah. that is what you all yeah. want to and do. One of the biggest things we hear about on the planning board, of course, from businesses is the sense of security for their customers or their staff. So I'm sure if there was to be a new car dealership to open up on King Street, they would want to make sure to showcase their wares after eight o'clock at night when their salespeople go home. So that's going to be a tricky discussion, but I think it's necessary. I think that even, um, sorry, to, <laughs> go through, I'm sorry. I, I was just wanted to respond to that because I think the most recent car dealership, you did require that they turn off at the close of business, except they're allowed to have motion sensors because there was that safety security issue with cars and um, not wanting to lose all the catalytic converters at once um, that they could be, you know, um, put on motion sensor. So that's one way to, I think, address that, um, concern, even if you have the requirement that the lights go off. Well, so there's two, diff there are two different issues that George raised. One was about the sports lighting mm -hmm. and that in cur it's currently, um, exempt from the lumen cap and shielding with, when, with certain conditions, and the quest, there's a question there that we talked about, which was, you know, say Northampton High School decides to redo all its lighting. Um, <clears throat> there is new new lighting that would meet the shielding requirements. Would many more of those have to be put in in order to, you know, meet the the full coverage of the field, uh, or <clears throat> as opposed to the current, you know, the the um, a brighter <clears throat> the flood flood the light that would flood flood the area, but might cause a bomb, but wouldn't have the shielding that necessarily would be required. Am I am I saying that correct? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that would be the um, potential trade off. Um, uh, whether how many more 
posts would need to be um, installed to meet the same, you know, even light levels across a field, which would be important for playing baseball or soccer or what have, or lacrosse and being able to follow a tiny ball across the field versus just walking to your car in a parking lot. Um, Recognize James. Thanks. Um, uh, on both points, for the sports lighting there, um, it's totally possible to have all the sports lighting you need for fast ball sports with small balls uh, for any um, accredited uh, sports games through um, NCAA or, or any other sports federation. Uh, it has been done. There's a whole... Um, there's a whole uh, website devoted to this that you can look up at uh, darksky.org on uh, dark sky friendly sports lighting. Um, there's a company, the main company that makes sports lighting is Musco. Um, they did, for example, Smith College's sports lighting. It was pre LED. It went in just at the, they, they probably, anyway, they probably made a mistake in not putting out LEDs, but they're going to have to replace them eventually. Right now, they're terrible. They shine right in our observatory dome. The, they make the sky literally twice as bright uh, as uh, when the lights are off. And sports lighting is one of the fastest growing contributors to light pollution nationwide. Uh, so it's totally possible to illuminate just the field with, with LED, new LED lights that are full cut off so that there's a, just a square around the field where the light is on the field and not on the neighboring areas. Uh, there's one in uh, New Milford, Connecticut. I believe there's one in uh, Westfield, which I haven't seen myself, uh, but uh, uh, we just get in touch with Musco and they'll tell us, yeah, here's how much it would cost to do it. You don't necessarily need more poles. You just need more carefully designed lights. And in fact, Smith is now, we have the ball rolling to replace the old high glare lights at Smith that literally shine up in the sky. You can see them from across the pond, poking you in the eye to replace those with full cutoff LEDs. Uh, so I think that's that's going to be the future for sure. And my feeling is we should not exempt that in the code. And I, I do think we should we should just acknowledge, look, this is a main source of light pollution and they should be they should be subject. We should pay the extra money if necessary to put in uh, dark sky friendly lighting. Uh, with regard to uh, uh, car dealerships, um, Could I just ask a question about what you're to clarify what you're saying yeah. about um, point eight of the exemptions? Um, you're recommending that they be exempt, that they not be exempt in any way, or not, or just not exempt from the shielding requirements. Um, There's a lumen. Yeah, I, I would say just the shielding requirement. That's right. Okay. I think it's going to be impossible. Uh, right. So thanks for that. Um, I think it's probably impossible to um, to keep the lumen cap and still um, meet the NCAA and other sports requirements for illumination levels, right? But the glare requirement, I, I think, should my advice would be to maintain that. Okay. Um, and you had another point. Yeah, just about the car dealerships. Um, the the claim from from car dealerships is usually uh, we need lots of bright lighting um, to protect our um, our stock. But I don't think that that's true. Um, it's really to attract attention and uh, business. And uh, if the lights are going to be on, I mean, it's great that the city is already saying, no, you have to turn the lights off after after hours. But if the lights are on, shouldn't they be shining on the cars themselves, not in the in the eyes of passersby and drivers along the way? Certainly not up into the sky. So again, um, <clears throat> that's the current requirement. So that's right. already there. Great. And I just wanted to point out that my catalytic converter was stolen from my car directly underneath the street light outside my house. I'm sorry. So that's one of at least three in the city I know of exactly the same thing. Catalytic converter stolen from directly underneath the street light. Street lights don't stop crime and they don't stop theft. And they're, they're not going to stop it in a car dealership anywhere uh, differently. So um, it's not it's not about uh, safety and security. It's about uh, selling cars. Marissa, I do. Um, I do have to push back a little bit. I I agree that it doesn't um, deter uh, theft, especially theft that involves uh, where light is very helpful, um, which I would think catalytic converter is. Um, it it um, it is it is a, a real safety factor, though, for other kinds of uh, uh, crime in which darkness is in fact favorable to the 
person trying to commit it. So I, I've, I've heard you say that a, a few times. I totally get what you're coming from, but um, I, I just, I want to, I want to, I, ha- I think I was glad to see the provisions for the ATM, the drive up bank ATM. Um, I think that, um, you know, I, I am concerned about like large parking lots and um, about large parking lots, you know, during hours with when employees and, and folks are going to be uh, entering and leaving. And, uh, and I think, you know, frankly, one of these days we'll have a conversation about the rail trail and, and it's, it's going to have to be squarely addressed and considered um, bad things do in fact happen uh, at, in the dark. But do they happen because of the dark? Yeah, they do. That that is Jim, for science. Don't argue with me. You don't you don't know me well enough so, to not argue on this. But but yeah, since we're we're in a public hearing format, <laughs> I don't want us to get into a back and forth. We're here to hear you and then to yeah. to address uh to consider. But we're um, we usually don't de- deliberate and we don't deliberate you know back and forth with the public in in this okay. format. Um. So thank you. Thanks. Um, I wanted to look at page six, uh, EE control. Um, this is under what is the, the the section is standards, um, but it's the top of page six. Um, <clears throat> the it currently reads: um, all site lights shall be automatically controlled to dim up to fifty percent maximum lumen output extinguish after midnight or be placed on motion sensors thereafter which are timed to turn off five minutes after motion is detected and i guess my question for us all and carolyn and i spoke to this a bit um was do do we feel that this extinguish after midnight um is is an is necessary uh to in, to include as an option when dimming to 50% maximum lumen output or um, placed on motion sensors uh, is either so there, there's 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 a value question here I think for us to talk about of of is is the is letting people so you know a business that may close at 5 p.m could have their um just leave the lights on till midnight and have those turn off at full full uh, output. And so I'd be curious to hear the m- members' thoughts about um, that and if you have anything to add as well. Uh, I would only just add that uh, um, it seems like um, that could be a path to take or alternatively the path would be just lights off except for motion sensor after close. Uh-huh. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, so you could have the path of just dimming um, or completely turned off, or I guess anything in between, <laughs> but that was sort of um, generated that um, my comment initially is sort of that qualitative, you know, what which way, what path do you want to take? Mm-hmm. Well, Alex, you're asking if, in in the way that the this section control is written, it gives the um, the owner of the lights the option of selecting one of those three. Yeah, correct. And uh, I, I mean, I I question at this time of year, uh, extinguishing after midnight means that we're in seven plus hours of of darkness and 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 so i my i guess i would question why uh why we would why that would be allowed as an option i mm-hmm. i i i don't i don't see the need for that other thoughts comments i'm sorry Hearing is still open. We're not going to be making uh, amendments, but I'm, I'm just wanted to raise that.
Uh, I have a question a little bit about enforcement of that. The only argument I, well, an argument I could see for having a specific time um, for everybody as opposed to close of business is that it's a lot easier to say, okay, it's it's, it's 1 a.m. and these parking lot lights are still on as opposed to, oh, it's 8.15 and Big Y is or isn't open. Um, I don't know if from an enforcement perspective that just makes it more difficult Um Barring that, my tendency is that um, site lights should go off at close of business as long as, you know, employees who are getting out to their cars and so forth can do so safely, which can be achieved by motion sensors. So, Carol, I don't know if you can speak toward the enforcement issue at all. Sorry. I, yeah, I disagree with that. I, I don't think motion sensors for people who are leaving a restaurant like two hours. I don't know. It just seems unsafe. I mean, yeah. it gets dark at five o'clock. If it, if some place closes at five and someone's working till eight, they have to like walk through the dark. I don't know. It seems overly paternalistic to me to make people. Well, wouldn't eight be close of business at that? I mean, if somebody is still working. Well, close of business still... is until the last employee leaves. Well, yeah, that's so then that's going to be impossible to regulate. How basically. do we <laughs> right? How do we define what means close of business? Might be current um currently in this section or the proposed in this section says during site plan review, the planning board may require that light be extinguished after the close of business. So so there's also uh an opportunity for um the planning for us to say how much leeway the planning board has as it's granting each application. And uh, uh, there was a question for you in there. Yeah. I mean, in terms of enforcement, I think you're right. It's much easier to say, you know, take a run down King Street and peg all the businesses that don't have their lights off at midnight or whatever the time is that the um, council thinks is appropriate. Um, and um, just to speak to the other, so that's the enforcement thing. You could, uh, I know that I think the planning board and maybe the zoning board has also allowed sort of that window for employees to finish up and wrap up and say so an hour after close of business which of course then makes it potentially more difficult to enforce um if you don't have a time that's uh, you know um that everyone can um see and easily you know you could also have any resident call up and say hey big y had its lights on at 1 a.m and, um, you know, so you're right. Um, I, I think Jana's right that it does make it more complicated if it's tied to the close of business. Um, is there someone in the uh, Zoom public who wanted, I saw a hand go up, but now it's down. Okay, well, just feel free to raise your hand again if you wanted to speak. Okay, Andy, I'm going to ask you to unmute and if you could state your name and city or town. Okay, hello, my name is Andy. Um, I used to be a resident of Northampton. I'm now um, in New York State, um, but um, I am um, very interested in um, the going uh, goings on happening in uh, uh, Northampton and Western Mass community. Um, and um, a tremendous amount of concerns. Um, and um, I've been um, listening attentively to um, uh, all that's being said, and I applaud um, the Dark Skies Initiative. Um, and uh, that that that's important. Um, one one thing that um, really uh, it needs to be addressed is um, and and what's happening um, in Vermont, uh, where I also used to live, is um, a, a tremendous amount of safety sec security concerns. Um, uh, the Burlington Business Association um, has uh, have an initiative. Um, to have a, an escort service um, to escort people uh, who are working, especially late at night, uh, back to their vehicles because there's a tremendous amount of safety issues. Um, uh, Burlington, uh, Vermont, is, is just not the same as it once was. It's just a, uh, an increase. So, in Andy, 
I'm sorry. Yeah. I need to ask you to focus specifically on the we're 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 addressing a lighting ordinance here. Okay, all um, right. So I understand you're you're okay. talking about other communities and how they're addressing safety, but if okay. you could specifically talk about how you know we should address safety or or however, um, it, but you need to speak to the lighting ordinance that we're considering here. Okay. All right. Uh, so I'll just focus. So that this so so everything that that's being said about the lighting ordinance is very good. Um, I and I I just want to point out one what uh, every year I I participate in the um, Earth Hour, um, which is an initiative to turn off lights um, in as a, a duration time to raise awareness um, for the Dark Skies Initiative. So I think that has a lot of um, uh, good um, uh, 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 implications for cities. Um, and again, um, uh, about the lighting, um, one other uh, thing uh, that really needs to be addressed is EMF and 5G. Um, I've been reading about the harmful effects to the environment as well as health uh, related to um, EMF and uh, 5G radiation. And um, uh, you can uh, definitely check out the Americans for Responsible Technology for more information. And I yield back. Thank you so much for all the city council is doing. Thank you, Andy. Other comments, questions? No. George, your mic. I just want to raise the notion that much of this speaks to, uh, I know the efficiency and energy savings, and that might compute into dollars. That might also compute into positive impacts around our our carbon goals. And, and there's no reference at all here to our resiliency plan or our uh, goals for 2030 and 2050. And I wonder if there's some rationale that would kind of make sense is another reason why we're doing this, not only for the for the animals and uh, the solar um, displays, but does it also impact down the road on kind of our, our, our public buildings and their energy costs and things of that nature? I know when we look at site plans and uh, we often refer back to the sustainability plan for indicators. So that might be a, a place here where we can add some of that kind of language as a background. Is that a question or? No, that was a comment. comment. Okay. Comment okay. for the author, I think. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> Council, yeah, Marissa. So it, um, I mean, so it seems to me that well, and I agree because we're, you know, it's, you know, time is getting on tonight. I'm, I'm very, you know, interested to see what the the sort of edits and red lines that have been, uh, you know, come about even today. Maybe, um, well, I don't, you, I don't know, I don't want to preempt a question if you were heading toward another question, but I'm interested to sort of discuss the plan moving forward about when we might you know, um, re reconvene in our separate bodies to, um, revisit this and like where, where we're at. Um, cause I feel like it's a little hard to talk about when I don't know what the, the edits are, um, that, that might be put forward, um, down the road. Yeah. If, if there aren't more questions right now, um, I would be happy to talk about next steps, but I just do want to see if there are um, more comments or questions. Um, so I like, I, I, I would propose that we continue the public hearings um, and bring and have, have Carolyn incorporate suggestions that have been made um, and bring a uh, Propose and and bring that to to our next for legislative matters. That could be our meeting in two weeks. Um, it could also be our December eleventh meeting. The meeting in two weeks would be preferable to me because that way we could get this on city council for December fifth. 
um, so that's that's my thought as far as legislative matters is concerned. I I would like the reason I would like to hold the public hearing open is because once we get these revisions, then I would like to be able to hear from the public um, when when we when you know they could speak to the revisions in the meeting. And are we thinking about that this getting it back to council for passage or with a positive recommendation um, by the December 5th meeting? That would be my goal. Um, I I wonder, um, cause I, one thing I'm concerned and we, cause we've raised questions about like the enforceability and when businesses close and how all that works. I wonder um, uh, if community resources might be a reasonable place to have a, a discussion um, cause I, I do want to make sure that we're hearing from, you know, workers and from employers and business owners. Um, because I, I think, I mean, they're not all looking to replace their lights or whatever, but I, I think business owners will want to comply to the extent that they can now. And then also if we're talking about a provision that also has to do regardless of when they read when they redo their lights if of enforcement of of light ordinances sort of going forward um i think they it might be important to hear from those folks if we can if we can rustle up some, <laughs> some some interest um from from those quarters um in time mm -hmm. um, i would be for the next meeting for that is one week from today um which we 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 can't as a body refer it only the council can but that it could be self-generated um if if the chair was interested in bringing that i know the chair yeah <laughs> <laughs> i will I, I uh, just come I, I, the chair. I don't know if this is a planning board or a legislative it sounds like it's a legislative matters things but in my anecdotal unofficial uh unscientific uh, conversations around these issues um all of the public comment that I've gotten around these issues is directly the opposite of what we're hearing from the interested parties who come tonight. People who don't care about lighting in their everyday life, when they are asked to comment about the issue, issue see it completely as a security issue. And I think if we had a real public comment that was not the week of Thanksgiving, maybe, uh, we might get a broader impact uh, uh, a more impactful set of comments around this issue um, from a more representative population. So I don't know, to do this by December seems insane, but I'll go along with whatever though. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, David. <laughs> Caroline? Yeah, I just had a question, um, I guess, for both of um, you. One is if the, um, if it seems like enforceability might be easier if there's a time ex um, given for any business that's closed, you know, that the lights be turned off at midnight or one o'clock, whatever the time is, does that address your concern about the close of business or an hour after close of business um, regulation? Or would you still want it to go to community resources regardless of what that standard might be? Um, and that also, I guess, relates to David's question about whether, um, you know, does that affect his thinking too about who might want to be part of the conversation? Well, it's not my week to speak for David, but you said that already. <laughs> but I said it was not my week to watch David. Okay. Uh, but um, I, um, I, I mean, I feel like what, you know, we're moving towards something that I would feel, uh, you know, comfortable with. I agree that like um, the extinguish after midnight is is too long, like Councilor Moulton said. Um, I think um, that the, I, I, I mean, I will be, and I, and I am sorry that I kind of lost my temper a, a moment ago. I just, the, the safety considerations for, for um, in, employees and people leaving bars and restaurants and places of employment after dark and at night. And I'm, you know, we'll just say candidly women, um, you know, it's, it is somewhat the prerogative of folks who don't walk around having to be aware of their surroundings in the same way. Um, and that, um, that it is, that it is for, um, you know, folks who are leaving with cash, you know, rolls of 
money in their pocket um, from cash tips all night or who are having to think about, you know, what's the lighting like at the ATM machine I need to hit or at that kind of thing. Um, so I'm not trying to, you know, I, I think Northampton's a very safe city and I think that we are, um, and I, I'm actually quite resistant to the to claims that sort of overblow people's fears and about crime and the things that can happen. But I think we need to take it seriously. Um, and I think that, um, you know, and I think that's the key thing that we're seeking to address with the control. So I don't know what I'm saying the, the answer is, but yeah. um, I'm, I, and I'm big on enforceability. I am also though, that I, I do feel like that if we, that aspirational is always also good. So that if, if we, if we set um, a rule that says that it has to be an hour after business close to give time for employees, for instance, that seems like a reasonable compromise that actual enforceability of us writing and going around writing tickets. I'm in this circumstance somewhat less concerned about that. I think if problematic lighting places mm -hmm. are, you know, folks are are transgressing, leaving their lights on too long and that we will hear about it from neighbors and we will, you know, that that there is a mechanism that it can show itself. Mm -hmm. You know, the the ability to enforce is um the less is less, you know, uh it's less important to me than that we are going around writing tickets to business and business owners um, if their lights are on, you know, five, one hour and five minutes after. Um, the goal is the safety. The goal is the to meet the needs of the folks walking around in the city. So I have a follow-up question. So um, do you think it's the same, you would have the same concerns for businesses that have their own private parking lots as say businesses downtown where there's public parking and street lights, which are not affected by this provision. I mean, that's hard. It's, it kind of depends on the kind of business. I mean, are there, are there um, lighting requirements for like cannabis dispensaries aside from like, I mean, aside from whatever we do, is there any, I mean, it does seem like there's certain kinds of businesses, but in general, yeah. you know, um, uh, you know the, the, the bigger concern are folks who are obviously leaving places of business with cash in their pocket. And yeah, um, and it, downtown does seem like a, an appropriate place to focus um, and things like that. Um, so I, yeah. I don't think I have like every parking lot everywhere, every business. Yeah. But, but I'm okay. concerned about the, the, nighttime entertainment industry that, that, that those folks right and that uh, that makes um i i can understand that i think since there's shared parking that isn't necessarily private parking with separate site lights that that um that might not be a, the ordinance might not be applicable to that you know what I'm saying? You mean so, for like the parking lot? They're like if they're parked in the yeah, house parking right, lot, right, right, like that. Yeah, yes and no. I mean, it yeah. depends on the leaving out the back door and it's an alleyway or whatever. You know that kind of thing. Sure. Okay. Thanks. Well, I mean, I would make the point that um, if we hold the public hearing open at the next meeting of legislative matters, we can put the word out to invite people to come and speak, and that um, that could avoid the overhead of having a separate meeting to. Uh, to to reach those folks, um, it's still within the our jurisdiction since it's about this ordinance. <clears throat> uh, so, um, to the, the, I think one of the concerns is that we will be getting a new council in January, and that we will have to bring all of those folks up to speed on this ordinance. Um, which, if we need to do, of course we should do. Um, <clears throat> but um, if if we do think that we're able to do this in the next month, then that would mean, you know, that that might be fast. Uh, I mean, it would be faster clearly because it'd be <laughs> within the next month, but um, we wouldn't have that issue. Um, but all of this also depends on what the planning board decides to do because we, we have to have a legislative matters meeting after the planning board's recommendation is made. So um, <clears throat> I would, I, have see Chris um, has his hand up. Go ahead, Chris. Yeah, I'm just again wondering on um, how we can make comments, Carolyn, and get those incorporated 
um, because it does seem like a pretty rough draft right now. And as Melissa was saying, I'd also like to see these other edits that you're that you discussed today. Um, so I'm just wondering what all of that timing looks like and how I can contribute my you know nitpicky comments that I don't think we need to go over in this session, but um, you know how how I have the opportunity to get, put that input in. I mean, we're only meeting once in December. December, right? December fourteenth. Next week because of Thanksgiving, so it's going to be a hard push. And really, where the rubber meets the road is when we see applicants and talk about this code, the planning board. So, I think we're going to need some more time then. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you all um, agree to do a joint, another joint meeting in December or whatever, um, people, you know, it doesn't necessarily have to, it could be either a joint meeting or the um, planning board meets, then sends its recommendation to legislative matters, right? So you could do it that way. We can turn around. I mean, I have these, I, I didn't screen share, but I have the edits. And so we can turn those around quickly, Chris, and anybody can send edits and I can just add them to the red line and send them around to everybody pretty quickly. So um, depending on what you, what the planning board wants to do with either a joint or separate meeting, um, I guess is the <clears throat> determination. If I might back to uh, Councillor Elkins' notion of more public input, if we do another joint meeting, that doesn't really give us enough time. And you mentioned getting the word out, but practically we all struggle with that, right? How do you get the word out about something as seemingly boring as lighting ordinances? Does one of us approach the DNA, uh, the Chamber of Commerce, and have them help send the word out? Do you do it just in your newsletters? What's the most effective way to get people to show up to really talk about this and engage in it. I'm thinking <clears throat> we need to have a couple of more public hearings. If we only have one more joint hearing and it's on one certain night, not everybody will be able to engage in that. Um, I don't think this is as crucial to our civic life as many other ordinances that we've gone through, <laughs> but uh, public <laughs> input is needed for sure. Yeah. 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 So, Carolyn, who are the so in terms of the folks who would be most interested in the issue of lighting and, you know, and we're talking about, you know, maybe it's like an auto dealership or, you know, or it's a um, uh, grocery store or something like that. Where I, I don't sense that we're talking about any of the businesses downtown in particular. So it, it seems to be, you know, because there's the street lighting and. And the municipal lots, which we we tend to light, but I I know if we if we ask Big Y to show up, I, I'm not sure we would get the answer. I'm thinking it's more the people who actually design these these layouts are are they're the ones who are who are going to be um, most thoughtful about you know oh yeah you want you don't want to dim them because this and that you know that. If you're asking, you know, that once the structure is built and, and it's happening, that, you know, the, the lights are on. It's the way they operate. So um, I'm wondering if we can get some of those folks in here. I think that's where we'd get the best input. Uh, um, I guess I would say I disagree. <laughs> okay. um, and the only reason why I say that is because... Um, well, there's, I mean, there's two ways to look at it. They, you know, applicants want to know exactly what's expected of them, right? And then if you have a clear path, that makes it the easiest way to go. Always, when we went through this in 2007, whenever we talk about changing the lighting, there will always be the um, lighting engine, the lighting designers and the um, businesses that will say, there's no way we can work with this. It doesn't work. It's safety. We need blah, blah, blah. So I think you will get that. Um, and, you know, I think we've been through this um, review of applicants who didn't like the existing ordinance mm -hmm. and pushed back. So big Y gas station canopies, a perfect example. We've had other gas station canopies where the planning board, they were asking for a waiver from the standards. And they said, there's no way we can do this. It's gonna. I'm not going to let my 
I'm not going to let my wife come and get gas at this gas station canopy because the lighting is too dim. And the planning board held the line. They installed it and it's not too dim. Um, so I guess I would say, I'm not sure. I think we know what the levels are. I think the issues really are probably on the edges. They're not so much about what the light levels are, but what about restrictions about turning off lights at night? And I would also say downtown is important because people still complain about the maximum sign light level. So the sign manufacturers say, no, we can't possibly do that. They can, but again, it's just sort of, if um, we know we've been through this, we know that these things can be built and that they work. Um, so I guess it really just, what are you looking for? And so maybe it's more about the users, the people who might feel uncomfortable about leaving if their boss turns off the lights at whatever, so. So based on what you're saying, that the planning board and the planning office have already incorporated, you've already been listening to people all along, that the recommendations that you're putting forward tonight have already taken into account, you know, those, the, all of the lessons you've learned from the big Y gas station to the auto dealerships and all of that. So... I guess we don't have to reach out to those guys mm -hmm. based on that. So. Marissa. Um, yeah. I mean, and to be clear and, and sort of like the technical specifications and I was on that planning board that, that said, no, no, Mr. Gas station, you, <laughs> you do not have these bright lights that you think you have. So, I, I mean, in terms of like the technical specifications and that I'm, you know, very happy to say, that is all that experience and work and work of advocates and um, like Dr. Lowenthal and all that. Um, I agree. I think we have some decisions to make about in uh, when the, the things are on and <laughs> when they're off and, you know, how we, and which, you know, so maybe if we boil that down. That's a much less complicated technical, you know, than, than the technical questions that go into all the, the bugs and the you know all 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 those things um so i and that's just the part that i i i i wonder you know if if we're hearing from 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 everyone who have, might have thoughts on that about just using it turn them on turn them off like when what how do we how do we deal with that i cuz i also know we're going to get a lot of also like you know, I not not just I'm concerned about employers, but also, you know, folks, you know, we already hear about the roundhouse parking lot. We already hear about, um, you know, certain areas where folks perceive themselves to be unsafe. And, um, you know, we I just want to be consistent about what we tell and what we do and what we tell what we expect of the folks who are doing the turning. So we what we need to decide now for both bodies is are we continuing the public hearing and then when how we're going to when we're going to meet uh and will that give us the opportunity to get input from all the people that we need to uh, we don't actually have to decide right now when we're going to meet we could do that <laughs> separately um but um and we'd have to re-advertise if you don't do it now right oh Okay, so you, so you, you need to... Yeah, okay. so you need a time and date certain. Otherwise, we'd have to go and advertise again. Okay, so we do need to yeah. decide right mm -hmm. now. <laughs> um, and I've heard, you know, do we do we think that it... that? So let, let's hear from the planning board about possible possible dates first. And, and let me just hear from you again, Alex, that uh, you can't bring this back to the city council until you get a recommendation from the, the legislative matters, gets a recommendation from the planning board. What are those? Is that correct? Yeah. So the legislative so. matters needs to be, and I, we may be able to suspend our rules, but we would like to be the, the last mm -hmm. body to make the recommendation to the city council okay. after we've heard from the planning board. Um, but that could be done in, if we do a joint meeting, it can be done at the same time. We'd hear your recommendation, then we'd make ours. 
so our our next planning board meeting is december 14th or is that right december uh december 14th so um and then you all have besides the 5th you also have the 11th is that right or no the 5th is a city council meeting oh um the, yeah we oh, sorry. we we, we currently have meetings scheduled for the 27th and the 11, 27th of november and the 11th of december for legislative matters right okay so we certainly could do a joint meeting on the 11th of december um or a joint meeting on the 14th right uh, which is the planning board. And do we have a lot of applications on the 14th? You just did one continuation, um, but we could also bump that a second. And then I don't know if there's another, there may be one other permit application. Could we have a separate public hearing just of the planning board on the 14th? You mean after a joint public hearing? No, no. I, oh. In lieu of a joint public hearing. I think... I, I, oh, but then it would have to go back to legislative matters. Their meeting is the 11th. So then it wouldn't go back till January, which means then it would be then it would be delayed um, until the new council has new subcommittee configuration. And we'd probably um, probably you'd want to table it because we wouldn't know the dates because you have to figure out the calendar too, right, for each of those committee meetings so you'd probably want to table it and then we'd re-advertise it and start again we've waited how long uh 15 years to do this i well no we didn't start right away after it was adopted in 2007 <laughs> <laughs> bring it out the red <laughs> Chris, I don't think we answered Chris's question about a process, and I had I, that. I think too. you did. It sounds like there's more work to be done. I don't know. I mean, it seemed like a pretty rough draft to me to begin with. So to think that we're going to bring this to city council and vote on it this year, it, it, that doesn't seem realistic to me. But others might disagree. Yeah, I, I tend to agree. I think there's a lot of issues in here that I'm just becoming aware of um, that weren't evident when I read our first draft um, that came to us. Um, and I like David's uh, offer earlier, his uh, idea of having it looked at by somebody who's really um, implemented in the field, whether it's one of the consultants that James talked about or somebody else on the business side of things. Um, and I know that may cost the city some money, but I think it'll be well worth it because I'm an expert, a quasi expert in some things, but certainly not lighting, even though I've installed a lot. It would be great to have another set of eyes on it and respectfully. This is, this is public material, right? I mean, I work with lighting designers all the time. Can, I mean, I, there's nothing stopping me from sending an email to someone, hey, what do you think of this? I mean, just casually. Just, I mean, that's yeah. not an official review, but this is all public knowledge right absolutely yeah. so yeah yeah i was um, thinking of doing the same david i mean i was just during our our session here i was i was perusing some lighting manufacturer websites just to see like you know what i could about their bug ratings and it's not even you know it's not even really advertised on their website so it's just not something that i'm familiar with um in the industry i, I mean they do say you know we have a low low G lights, but they don't say like, we have a G of two, you know what I mean? It wasn't so an issue until LEDs became universal. Yeah. Yeah, so I just want to talk to a few people and, and take their temperature on it. No pun intended. I think um, the, uh, I, I really like the value of having these joint sessions is, is great. I mean, I think we get to a broader range of issues and, and, and I think it's also better for the public, uh, just who understands it's easier for the public to understand like this is the joint committee that will be talking about this it's not like multiple places it's you know it's all very fuzzy to people who aren't in these uh things all the time so um the 11th works for me um the 14th i actually can't be at i realize because there's a middle school concert so uh oh that means i can't be there either uh selfishly <laughs> i can only get one of my kids to quit band so <laughs> um <laughs> i like the 11th 
So I'm hearing a little split from the planning board as far as whether uh, you want to take this up again in December or table it to uh, to. I will submit. I didn't understand all the other stuff with the new council and stuff. So I'm going to let other people decide. Yeah, we else. have so we have two two options. We we either um, take it up again with the joint pub, public hearing, most likely in December, and it sounds like December 11th might be the <coughs> most likely date. Um, or we table the item. The planning board tables the item. I'm not sure what our process would be since we have a time limit. We may have to be withdrawn the sponsor could withdraw it i'm not sure we'd figure that out um, and we would reintroduce it in the new year with the new council so those are two options is that right carolyn yeah i mean i don't think you need to um i think you could carry it over to the new council so it doesn't need to be reintroduced and then there's just it just needs to be re-advertised because we won't know the date for the right. continued public hearing right are there many other large items with legislative matters that are just going to cloud up the agenda for the new members when they come on board? Um, I just think it's been, we've lived with this original ordinance, well, the, the lighting ordinance from 2007, 15 years. I really don't want to rush this one because of this little timing with the new counselors. Um, I think... As a matter of fact, this might be an interesting thing for the new members of the legislative matters to get their teeth into. Um, I I I just feel like we'd be rushing it if we tried to do a joint meeting on the 11th and then both of us and for the planning board members then to come to an agreement on the 11th about a recommendation to the board. Uh -huh. Yeah, I definitely respect that <clears throat> desire to to not rush it, um, Stan. Uh, I, I agree with that. I, I think that um, the combination of trying to get the technical uh, reaction that has been uh, talked about um, and making sure that the public has an opportunity to review that, that final revision that comes to us uh, with the fact that it's it's you know it's the holiday period and i just think that we're asking we're asking we're asking too much and while i respect alex your desire to to get this through the current counselor council i just i i think uh, I, I i just feel uncomfortable with with rushing it also anyone else like to speak to the decision Then I, I would propose. Uh, can, can I say something? I guess yeah. I feel like the 11th is almost a month from now. And yes, we're in the holiday season. So there's a lot going on. But what I'm hearing from Carolyn is that she's already made a bunch of the edits coming out of the conversations that she had with Councilor Jarrett this afternoon. And it sounds like is prepared to make some further edits uh, based on this conversation on additional feedback forthcoming from folks. Um, I feel like we have a really good momentum to this conversation. And what we've seen on the planning board is sometimes when there are really wide gaps between conversations, you you gain something and you lose something from that, um, that people who are involved in the original conversation aren't there and can't necessarily speak as much as new voices to the concerns that were originally raised. So um, as David said, I really value the you know, these joint conversations. And I would be prepared to, in a month, come back together and see if we're ready. And if we're not, then we can table it at that time. But I'm not sure why we would today decide that we're definitely not going to be ready a month from now. I don't necessarily feel that way. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I, I'd like to vote on this before the end of the term. <laughs> and, um, but I, I'm sensing, the, you know, in, in a planning board, it sounds like, you know, just like Jana was saying, if you guys could, you know, get on board with, you know, where you're at, I, I don't know how far apart you are, but you you actually may be closer than we think. And um, and that the other thing is what I think, you know, to, to uh, what George spoke to about um, getting somebody to consult, in particular, somebody with that dark side, dark skies, like, um uh perspective 
that could also help accelerate things. That if the the planning board works out their details, we have that oh you know that perspective from the outside consultant that has the dark skies view on things and you know can check those boxes. I I I'm not sure how as as a counselor you know that I, I'm looking at this and. It looks like it's dark skies, and I think it might be, but to have somebody actually check the box and say, yeah, 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 yeah. And and I think that would make it so that it could actually move through council this session. So so it's on planning board. There you go. <laughs> yeah, so. um, I just, I, I, I tend to agree that uh, I feel like we kind of sussed out uh, a uh, sort of the enforceability and the sort of control and operation side of things, which strikes me as much more of a legislative uh, kind of uh, a legislative matter um, and, and sort of ordinance matter as opposed to the technical side of things, which I'm actually quite comfortable with um, and quite comfortable that it would, it will be there to the extent that, you know, for the for revisions and edits that I, I frankly listen to the very smart people who are coming with these goals and priorities and implementation and and I'm, I feel like we can get there by the 11th, I guess is what I'm saying. Um, and that there's a couple of, um, you know, questions and decisions we have to make and weigh, but I think it's certainly well within what we can do as long, but I really want to reach out to, to some constituencies that haven't been a part of this conversation for this, you know, extended period of time, but I think, I think we can do it. Uh, oh, just because you're on the this committee, I'll go to you a, first. A question for Marissa. So what are those constituencies so we can start thinking about them right now? I, I'm in, I'm concerned about workers. I'm concerned about folks who are um, working in the, in particular, the entertainment or late night businesses mm -hmm. um, type situations um, and, you know, what their, their needs are. Um, and, um, I don't really care to open it up to, I mean, we just hear from whoever wants to hear, but you know, I, I don't, if, if the big, you know, the big wire, the gas station wants to come and tell us their lights need to be brighter. I, I've heard that before. Mm -hmm. Um, so, but it's, it's in particular folks who are, have a need to be out walking around at night, not, not, be, not because they're, uh, but because they have to be, you know, um, and specific. And yeah. Right. So that, that's that's who I would like specifically to hear. Thank you. George. So to move this forward efficiently, lens, the public would have one more chance to weigh in on the 11th and then another chance at the city council meeting two times mm -hmm. before it goes through a second reading and it's passed. Correct. Uh, no. So in December, we have, we, we, if we meet on the 11th, then... Um, our last council meeting of the term is December 21st. And that's, that's our second reading. Okay. It's already been introduced. Okay. So that there would be two times the 11th and the 21st. Okay. So if we decide on the 11th, right. That we're ready. Right. And I think that's the key here is that this doesn't preclude us from deciding to table it or could, until the next term. Right. Um, if, but it gives us the option to finish it in this term. Okay. Can I caucus with the planning board for a minute? Yes, please. So, uh, Chris, um, does that give you enough time to move forward with some edits in red after you see the next revision from Carolyn? As Janice said, it's almost four weeks away. Would you be able to review it and get back some wordsmithing and some different things to Carolyn? Yeah, I mean, certainly it just depends when I get it, right? So if Carolyn has that, next week that would be great and that, um, would... that would be fine i i just wasn't sure what, i guess i was asking carolyn what the process is are carolyn are you going to circulate a word document and and then we can all add you know track changes to it or something is that what we're doing um no you should send your um proposed track changes to me so that there's not group editing happening outside of a public hearing and then i can incorporate those and then send them to laura so is there a word document that i can do that to 
I guess I'd like to see what I your... sent. I sent it out, but I didn't have the wordsmithing. Like there's, there's definitely phrases that can be edited. I don't know that we need to, I don't, I don't know that I necessarily need all of those from, from you, but there's the technical changes. So sort of the big changes are in that. I, I, I sent that out to the board just now. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Thank you. So, and that was a word document. So you just want track changes back? Yeah. Okay. Not reply all. No, don't reply all. Just to me. Right. Exactly. Okay. Yep. No, that that's clear on the process. So that's great. And then, and then the other thing we're asking is just so we'll just have two nights of my week in December where I'll be volunteering. Is the other ask? Correct. The eleventh and the fourteenth. Great. Monday and a Thursday. Okay. All right. Thank you for your service. <laughs> Followed Great. by a party. Um, <laughs> so the plan, I think then the planning board is willing to move forward and have an I think schedule. Stacy has a comment here. Stacy's here. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, George. Um, I have a <laughs> question about the, <clears throat> so the process, this is the first time I've been in this type of process. Um, and <clears throat> I think somebody mentioned like normally when something like this comes up, um, we would, the planning board would go like, go through it line by line. Um, so we're not going to have that opportunity to meet together until we all meet on the 11th. Um, and if, and then if we vote to move this forward, that would be the folks who are here during the joint meeting. Is that how that works? It just feels a little weird that we don't have just the planning board sort of discussing this together. Yeah. So on the, if we do a joint meeting on the 11th, we'd all be here um, and we could all discuss it together. But it, okay. and I'd be happy at that point to go over it line by line if, if folks felt like that was helpful personally. And then the planning board votes by themselves to pass on a recommendation with such and such comments or not at that time. Correct. And then we would vote on that recommend on a recommendation. Can I add one more process note? Yeah. But the um the need to go over line by line depends a lot on what we do uh individually and how we work with the sponsor of the uh with Carolyn. Um and I I we so we can do that, and I don't want to dissuade anybody from doing it. But that is not strictly necessary. That is not how we have to do this, unless we get to that night and find that there is a lot of sort of collaborative editing that we we need or want to do. So uh, that is that is that really is a product of getting as much as, and we can't. the The trick is we can't we can't do like a Google Doc. We can't collaborate. Um, that's against open meeting laws. But what we can do is anybody who has thoughts or ideas, they can funnel them all to Carolyn and and we can, uh, so that what we get back and what gets circulated to us in advance of that is as complete and as final as as we we hope to to be able to discuss. Because I kind of, feel, I'm looking at Stacy. I feel like she's kind of being like, oh God, what are we, what are we going to be doing on the 11th? <laughs> but, um, but I don't think it has to go that way unless we just... We had a lot of consensus here, I think. Yeah. yeah, but I think there's a lot of pieces that we haven't touched on yet. When we touched on two big concepts around enforcement and what was the second one, but there are some other kind of things, and I think there would have some discussion. Um, what, could I suggest then that there would be another, after all those individual comments come back to Carolyn, there would be another revision of this put out to the board before the 11th, a couple of days to look at. We wouldn't see it on the 11th. Right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah that's what I meant. Sorry. That's exactly yeah. what I meant was that what, what, what we see in, in advance of the 11th. Yeah, because we're allowed to circulate uh, comments that will be discussed only at the meeting. Right. So, uh, you know, right. all of our right. suggestions that we come up with in the next four weeks, uh, we could we could 
see those and discuss them on the 11th if we wanted to. And just to be clear, to continue this kind of process, I can call Chris Tate and talk about issues within this document without making any decision. We're not a quorum, right? You're not a quorum, but it's probably not, it's cleaner not to do that. Uh -huh. <laughs> it's a clean city government. Well, I actually, I want to, I would, um, uh, a thing that is not, uh, the open meeting law is the open meeting law. You you can't talk to more than, and not serially, you can't talk to yeah. more than your, your uh, quorum. Right. So, uh, no, not even a quorum. Not more than the quorum. You can't talk with a Yeah, you can't talk with a, a yeah, no, sorry. Right. Four, yeah. right. Um, but I I resist we 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 have to comply with over meaning law. We don't have to we don't get an A for effort. We don't get an A plus. Um so All right. So but, yeah. but the serial thing is important. The serial thing is very important. Yep. So I'm not suggesting otherwise, but sometimes I feel like we there's a culture here and it's good. It's good because we're trying to comply, but where we um uh, where we are more conservative than we need to be. And sometimes it um, is not as productive right. um, the, as if I, as if we lived within the law, but not didn't go for the A plus right. for everything. Yeah. I, I just want to echo, I think one of the things that we didn't really discuss very much tonight, which I think is going to be highly controversial is the signage part of it. Yep. I think that was the part that we found least easy to test when we were on site doing our field trip the other day. Um, and, uh, I think it's the kind of thing that the businesses are going to be highly sensitive to, uh, cause if there's one thing you want is your sign lit up when your business is closed. Um, so, uh, I would just encourage everyone to spend some time thinking about that so we can get a good conversation next time about it. Thanks. Yeah. And, um, and I don't know if it's even going to drive everyone nuts. If it, if something, if some part of this does become controversial, more um if there would be any appetite to like passing most of this like striking the controversial part so we can get a lot of this is really non-controversial and we should just do it um so uh, i would be open to some kind of mixed bag there um i want to before the planning board makes its decision and then us i want to recognize james <clears throat> uh thank you just a quick question how uh would members of the public be apprised of the new version in time to respond and uh, and make uh, intelligent, useful comments at the at the hearing on the 11th. How, how will we see a new draft? Well, it'll get posted 48 hours ahead, right? So, yeah. Yep. <clears throat> Is the planning board ready to uh, make a decision about continuing the public hearing? Yes. I believe so. Yeah, I think I'll I'll posit that we're willing to um, continue the hearing until December eleventh at five thirty. Five. Normally we meet at five. Okay. There's. I'm not sure if that conflicts with any of the planning board members' work schedules. So I want to make sure that those people who engage tonight can do it. But I'll propose that we. Um, continue our uh, our portion of the public hearing to the joint hearing on uh, Monday, December 11th at five o'clock. And before you vote on that, I uh, would like just like to hear from legislative matters that, uh, well, I'll make a motion that we uh, continue <clears throat> the public hearing until Monday, December 11th at five o'clock. I second that. Okay, so we have uh, that on the floor. Are there any more comments on that? Or I guess the planning board needs right. a second. Right. Uh, but uh, I'll second. The okay. Um, so uh, motion made by Alex Jarrett, seconded by Marissa Elkins for legislative matters. Motion made by George Kohout and seconded by David Whitehill for the planning board. Is there any discussion on that from either body? Okay. No, just understanding that it nothing has to be wrapped up with a pretty bow by the end of the 11th. Absolutely. Okay. And it's a public hearing, and somehow we will get the word out to the community to attend. We can talk about those details later. Okay. Yeah. 
If there's no further discussion than a roll call. Oh, um, for both boards. Okay. Yeah. Councillor Jarrett. Yes. Councillor Elkins. Yes. Councillor Molden. Yes. And Councillor Nash. Yes. Here, one second. Um, member Kohal. Yes. Okay. Um, member White. Yes. And I can see the order. Member Dakai. Yes. Member Tate. Ah, I don't know. Yes. I'm sorry. Do they call Member Whitehill? Yes. Yeah. Am I missing anything? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it passes unanimously with both bodies. And um, unless there's anything else, it would be time to adjourn. Move to adjourn. Second. Made by Nurse Elkin, seconded by Jim Nash. No discussion on adjournment for legislative matters. No roll, roll call. We're all here. Well, just because there are yeah, yeah, participants, yeah. I'm yeah, just yeah. going to... Play it safe. Jared. Yes. Councilor Elkins. Yes. Councilor Molden. Yes. Councilor Nash. Yes. Legislative matters is adjourned. Great. Uh, motion to adjourn the planning board portion of the public hearing. Second. Okay. Thank you, Jenna. Uh, member Whitehill. Yep. Uh, member Decay, I don't ever use Stacy's last name. Stacy, Stacy, yes, <laughs> it's Gakey, by the way. Gakey, okay. Um, Chris Tate, yes. Uh, Chair George, yes. Who did I miss? Who did I miss? Me, you, you oh. missed me, and I vote yes. Okay, thank you. The motion's uh, passed unanimously to adjourn, Chris.